right, then. Good afternoon. Uh, we are here to discuss open access. Uh, I'm Robert Carroll. I'm one of the librarians at the Harris Library, where uh, we're always happy to help with all sorts of things, including questions like this uh, regarding publishing with open access or accessing it. Um, we, uh, the librarians and the libraries have been kind of leading the, uh, the charge into open access and trying to get the uh, university up to date on uh, various practices. And we certainly want to help faculty work with it and students as well. And we happen to have with us today the scholarly communication and copyright librarian. Wait a minute. <laughs> Are you with me? All right. We're all good. All right. Uh, anyway, scholarly communication and copyright librarian. I've memorized that title. Here she is, Karen Caputo. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thanks for having me today. Um, so we're going to talk about all things open access, especially around journal publishing and our institutional repository scholarly commons. Um, but we're going to start at the very beginning, what is open access? Um, and many of you probably already know it's a movement to make online publications um, freely available to read and reuse. Um, uh, and when we talk about publications, we can talk about a lot of different scholarly articles, journal articles, maybe book chapters or books. Um, there's lots of, of products that we might be talking about that we can make open access. Um, but we're you know, talking about open access too, because this becomes an easy way to share work globally um, using um, anyone with an internet connection can access something if it's, if it's openly available. And there's no financial barriers to their access. They don't have to have a subscription uh, to access the articles. Um, so that really opens it up to a wider audience as well. Um, but one thing I wanted to kind of mention to you that um, you might have heard about is that this is part of a bigger movement around open. Um, and you might have heard terms like open science and open scholarship and open research. Um, and these are all kind of umbrella terms under which I would say open access fits, as well as things like open data, um, where you share your data openly, um, and uh, open protocols and open methods. Uh, there's lots of different products within the research life cycle that people are trying to share openly. Um, and so open access is just one piece of that that deals with the publications. Uh, so why would you want to share your work openly? Um, the biggest reason is really the exposure that you get. Um, uh, because it's openly available online, it's available to a much wider audience. Um, there are, you know, no financial barriers for um, researchers, as I mentioned before. So even researchers and less affluent um, institutions or maybe independent research researchers who don't have the resources of an institution have access to this. And then outside of higher education, there's also, um, you know, others who might want to use your research, practitioners who might want to use it in the field, or policymakers, um, or even public uh, who might want to use it for their own personal use. So it also widens the audience from that perspective, too. Um, and of course, a lot of our research and scholarship is indirectly or directly funded uh, through public money. So there's also sort of a public um, benefit um, that people see to making sure that research is, is freely available. Um, there's also been some um, show, uh, some research that shows that open access articles also get higher citation rates, which makes a lot of sense because they're more openly available to anyone. But I think what's even more interesting was that there was a, a article last week, uh, last month that was published that actually found that um, open access journal articles receive more diverse citations than um, traditional paywalled um, journal articles. And they found this that um, they receive more geographical um, diversity in citation and more discipline diversity in citation. And this was true across all subject areas, which was really interesting. I've actually linked that article um, in this presentation too, and I can share um, with people. So if you're interested in learning more about that, but I thought that was kind of an interesting new development um, around uh, why open access is, is really great uh, for authors too. Um, so hopefully by now I've convinced you that open access is a good thing to participate in. 
Um, but you might be wondering, how can I actually um, participate in um, open? Um, and we're going to talk about two main pathways to make your work openly available. And one is open access journal publishing, um, and the other one is open access um, repository deposit. And even though these are depicted as separate routes, you'll see I've connected them because you can do both. You can publish an open access journal and then you can deposit that article into a repository like our institutional repository, Scholarly Commons. So they're not mutually exclusive. You can do both um, or you can do one or the other. Um, so let's talk more about open access journal publishing. And please let me know if I'm talking too fast. Sometimes I tend to do that. <laughs> um, so one of the biggest questions I get around open access journal publishing is how is it different than um, publishing in a traditional paywall journal? And the answer is it's not really that different. Um, the difference is really that your work is openly available. Um, there's some myths out there that open access journals aren't peer reviewed. Um, that's not true either. They go through um, same review processes as traditional um, publishers. Uh, so you will feel very similar to um, publishing in a traditional journal. Um, there are sometimes different types and I don't like to get too much into jargon, but um, it's kind of important to know that, you know, there are some different types of open access uh, journals and one of them is hybrid. And as the name kind of suggests, it's both traditional paywalled articles as well as an open access option. Um, and uh, we'll talk about some uh, hybrid journals that you can um, actually publish in. Uh, here. And then there's open access journals. And when people say fully open access, that just means that all the articles that are published by that journal are open access. So um, those are kind of just, there's some different types, but um, for for our purposes, uh, open access journals can, can mean a few different things. Um, some of these do charge authors a fee to publish it. And these are called article processing charges or APCs. We're going to talk about how to avoid those charges and not pay those processing uh, charges. So that's what I'm going to focus on today is, is ways that you can um, uh, publish for free at no cost to authors. Um, but um, there are sometimes publication fees that you might be asked in other journals. Um, and so that's something to consider when you are thinking about publishing an open access journal is the cost that might be um, that may or may not um, exist. Um, usually journals should be pretty transparent about their costs on their website. And if they are not, I would be very skeptical that that is a legitimate or a quality journal. So just one thing to, to think about. Um, this is more jargon. People call this gold OA. So if you're uh, wondering, you've heard this term gold OA, it's typically um, means that it's published open access. Um, and next, we want to just talk about what are these OA uh, publishing options that are no cost? Um, so actually, at the university, we have agreements with several uh, publishers where our authors can publish at no cost open access. Um, we typically with these, um, they are negotiated through our library uh, consortia, OhioLink. So if you've heard of OhioLink, it is um, uh, academic library consortia that we negotiate um, on, on these kind of deals with to get the best deal possible for the whole um, state. Um, and publishers will offer you this option um, if you're eligible um, during the publication process at the point of acceptance. So even if you didn't know about it, um, the, the publisher should be offering it to you because they'll recognize that you are affiliated uh, with our institution. Um, but we still recommend making sure that if you want to publish in one of these, that you are the corresponding author or another Ohio link author isn't a corresponding author um, because the uh, eligibility is based on the corresponding author's uh, affiliation. Um, and we do recommend too that you use your CWRU email address just to help us verify that. I'm actually going to go there's this is a link um, and I'll put this link also in the chat if that's helpful for people, um, if you want to follow along. Um, but we have a whole guide on these um, agreements and um, you can see all the publishers we have 
eight total publishers right now that we have agreements with. Um, I'm not going to go through every single one. I'm going to maybe focus on some of the ones that are more subject relevant to you all. Um, and uh, but it is it's helpful to know. And and if you're wondering why there's these Ohio Link or um, you know Cleveland Health Sciences Library. Um, indications. That's just who the agreement um, was negotiated with. So Ohio Link does a lot of our bigger ones like Cambridge University Press Journals, um, Elsevier, and Springer Nature, as well as Wiley. Um, and um, if you're interested in finding a journal with one of those publishers that um, you can get this, uh, you know, no APC uh, uh, open access publishing, you can click on the left hand side um, and learn more about this. Cambridge is really great because all Cambridge journals are um, included. So you don't have to, to look at, you know, select which one, but we do have a link to um, their journal list. So you can look through and see which ones might be relevant to you. Um, Elsevier, it's only their hybrid open access journals. So none of their fully open access journals. Um, and we have a journal finder tool here. They actually have a really great um, page on this um, to help, uh, I'll accept them, I guess, um, that uh, to help you find, you know, ones in your subject area. Um, Nancy Aralik and I were just talking about this because she was looking at one and wanted to just verify that it was part of this agreement. And uh, so if you ever have questions like that, you wanna verify, I am the person to, to help talk about this. I'm the um, uh, point of contact for these agreements. Um, in addition to Elsevier, Springer also is only hybrid journals. So again, um, if you're looking for that list, I would go to the information page and, and find that. And Wiley is actually a combination of hybrid and open access journals, but it's select ones. And so they have a different spreadsheet for each one that you can see here. It's not the greatest thing, I will admit, that's what they gave us. <laughs> um, uh, but it is, um, they do have the, the spreadsheets. Um, uh, they have a subject filter, so you can um, help uh, to, to look through them um, using that subject filter. So those are kind of the main, um, journal ones that I think will be really um, great and I hope people take advantage of them. One thing to note about these is there are yearly article caps. So we do have a limit of how many articles we can fund. And so if you are thinking about um, publishing in one of these publishers and taking advantage of the seal, I just recommend trying to do it earlier in the year. So it's a calendar year, not the academic year. Um, uh, so, you know, even thinking now about, um, you know, if you're going to making that plan. Um, uh, I can't say that we will run out. I just, we don't know. It depends how much people are publishing and how many people take advantage um, uh, of these deals. Um, I would like to mention that there's kind of one that's a little different. I know we're talking mostly about open access journal publishing, but there is a book um, uh, publisher that we work with and their model is a little bit different. And um, it is, I said, you know, you had to be the corresponding author for the other deals um, to, to be eligible. This model is actually, we help support this publisher that is an open access journal publisher and any author, no matter their institution, whether it's a um, CWRU author or an author at another institution gets free um, publishing, open access publishing through this publisher. They're what's called a diamond open access publisher. Um, and that just means diamond that it is free to authors. There's no author fees. Um, so this is one that we're supporting. Um, annual reviews is also another one that's that model um, that it's we support their journal um, and they offer um, open access publishing to all authors. So um, that's a little bit different uh, model, but um, if you're interested in open access publishing with either one of those, that's good to know too. Um, uh, and um, Speaking of those diamond journals, um, that is another place to go look um, to find more diamond journals. 
Um, so diamond open access journals are ones that don't, again, charge authors fees. So if you don't find a journal that you want to publish with through one of our agreements, um, you might be able to find a journal that doesn't charge author fees at all. And a really easy way to do that is by going to the directory of open access journals or doaj.org. Um, this, I really like this um, directory. It's an index of open access journals, um, but to be included in the index, you have to meet certain quality um, standards. So you have to adhere to the principles of transparency and best practices in scholarly publishing, which is an industry standard um, created by several industry organizations. Um, so it's really nice because you know that these journals have all met a minimum quality um, assurance uh, standard. And also they make it very easy to find journals without fees. Um, right here, they have over 13,000 journals without fees. Um, and you can um, use that search to find um, journals without fees and then use some of their filters um, to, you know, uh, to also uh, narrow that search. Sorry, I forgot the word narrow. Um, but let's just do a really quick keyword search for social work um, and you can find, you know, article um, journals that don't um, charge fees in social work. Um, and if you click on the um, journal, it will give you a little more information um, about, you know, the art the journal and, and give you links to get to their um, different areas of their website. So it's really helpful to, to just kind of get a good idea of, of is this a journal that you would want to, to publish in. Um, so I think that's the easiest way to find open access diamond journals. Um, and I like that, you know, you can be assured that these are quality journals as well, um, since they have to go through some vetting before they're allowed to be indexed. Um, there are some other options that I've just mentioned here, but I know sometimes those, those aren't always available. You know, if you have a funder, you might want to ask your funder or put it within your grant proposal, um, some of these open access fees. Sometimes I know I've heard from different faculty and, and researchers that their funders don't allow um, that. So it's not always available, but it never hurts to ask or find out um, asking a department or center if they can. I know that's not always possible though either. So, um, you know, that's why we have all these other options too. One thing too that people don't really realize is that often journals have waivers or discounts. Um, and often these discounts are for um, scholars in um, low income countries, but sometimes they're also for early career researchers too. Um, so I would just double check to see if you're eligible for one of these waivers or discounts, ask your publisher about it, search their website. They usually have this information also on their website. I will say sometimes they're not super clear about the criteria for a waiver. So you might have to, to talk to your editor a little bit about that. Um, so those are those no cost journal publishing options. There's another no cost option to you too, though, for participating in open access. And that's our second avenue. That's open access repository deposit. Um, a repository is really just a document server, um, essentially. And we, um, and there's different types of them. You might have heard of a lot of them. There's ones that are discipline specific. There's government um, repositories like PubMed Central is, is one of the big ones. Um, there's data specific uh, repositories. And then there's institutional repositories, which are repositories that hold the collected scholarship of a specific institution. And we have one called Scholarly Commons at CWRU. Um, where you can submit your work um, to uh, the repository to be shared freely online. Um, you can submit publications that you've previously published. So journal articles that you've previously published, you can submit those. Um, when you submit them, a librarian, usually me, um, will review your submission to make sure you know it fits within our scope that it is a scholarly article, um, but also that we are allowed to uh, post the article. So sometimes publishers have some uh, 
some restrictions on, on what you can post and what you can't post to an open access repository like ours. So I always do a check for every um, submission just to make sure that um, we're allowed to post it. So even if you're not sure if you're allowed to post it or not, that's a conversation that um, you can have with the librarians. Um, and then also you can uh, uh, put up publications that have not been previously published, um, such as preprints or reports. There's actually a very lovely white paper from one of um, your colleagues that is on the repository, and it is one of the most downloaded um, articles in the repository right now um, because it's not available anywhere else. Um, and I can show you that that article too. So um, there's you know options to add your also presentations. So if you've done presentations or posters or something like that, and uh, they're not available anywhere this is a place that you can um, make them available and get a permanent link so that you can link other people to it as well. Um, again, it's no cost, which is really nice to you all. Uh, and uh, again, more jargon, this is sometimes called green away or self archiving. That might be how you hear publishers or other people um, uh, talk about it. So I just like to, to mention that you might hear people discuss it this way. Um, so I actually want to go to our Scholarly Commons website just to give you a little tour of it. Um, it's commons.case.edu. Um, and uh, our homepage, you can browse scholarship by a few different ways. Um, there's, you know, research unit center department. This is where all the colleges and, and departments are, are listed. Um, we also have some journals that we host, um, campus journals that we host on the website. So if there is a department that uh, sponsors a journal, um, we we can host it. And um, you can see there's a couple different ones. We have an undergraduate research journal. Um, we have one from Weatherhead and one from um, the Women's Center. And we should be having another one actually joining um, from Weatherhead as well, um, another student journal. So um, there's that capability, but um, for submitting to uh, the repository, we're gonna go to this research, uh, browse by research so we can go to the Mandel School's faculty, staff and student scholarship landing page. Um, you can see how many times all of this scholarship has been downloaded and where it's been downloaded across the world. Um, if you submit your work to Scholarly Commons, you will get a monthly report that tells you what your downloads are and where um, your where people are accessing your work, what countries are they coming from. Um, and then it's um, we have a lot of, of different submissions going back, I think I saw it to 2001. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's really, a, a bunch of different journal articles that people have done reports, white papers, presentations, um, and we have, I know we have faculty, um, represented here. We also have some students who are represented here. Um, I'm not sure if staff are, I have to, I would have to look to see if staff or researchers are, uh, but definitely students and faculty have already submitted, um, their work. So I highly recommend, um, checking out what um, your fellow uh, uh, Mandel School colleagues are, are doing. Um, the one I was mentioning that happens to be uh, the white paper, I have to find it, it's Zoe Breen, yeah. Um, Company-based social work education. Yeah, this is one of our most downloaded articles. It's in our top 10 right now. So um, that's kind of exciting to see, um, you know, uh, something, especially since it's not available um, to others. Um, and if you want to submit your article um, or work, um, you'll just go to our submission page on the home page. I've also put a link um, in our um, presentation, but it's just the submit research button here at the bottom left corner of the menu. Um, it will ask you just to pick your, um, you know, who you are, what's your main role? Are you a faculty member? Are you a researcher or staff? Um, or you're a student. I know sometimes people have several roles here. So just pick the role that best describes you or that you would most consider yourself. Um, this isn't really like a, a meant to be a, 
a very definitive you are this or, or this. It's just meant to help us track how many um, uh, we're getting from each kind of group. Um, so if you're both a student and a staff member, for example, just, you know, you can, you can select either one. Um, that question has just come up a few times. Um, once you select your um, uh, role, um, you can just log in with your CWRU ID and fill out the form and um, upload your work. Uh, it's very easy. Um, there's only, I think, four actually required fields, the, pub the title, the author, which should um, fill in with your at least information, um, the date of publication, and the actual uploading of the article. Um, there are other fields that you can fill out, but you don't have to. Um, we also, the librarians, look at that information and we fill in anything that needs to be. So um, that's that's always good to know too. Um, and if you have maybe a lot of things that you want to upload or you have questions about the things you want to upload um, or you don't want to use the online form, that's okay too. Um, you can also email your submissions. You can either email, and um, I put the email here, it's digitalcommons at case.edu. So um, if, if you're not interested or you have questions, uh, you want to submit via email, that's also possible. Um, as well. And I work with a lot of people who prefer to do it via email. Or if you want me to look at, you know, a lot of different things to see what you can post, um, that that would be something that might be easier to do over email than the online form. Um, I probably went through that a little bit quicker than I meant to. Um, but <laughs> um, uh, but I did want to give time for Nancy Rollick and Robert Fisher, uh, Professor Rollick and Fisher, to um, give their experiences and then give time for everyone to ask questions, too. So, um, yeah, which wants to go first? <laughs> we need to talk over by the microphone. I don't think you do. Okay. So, all right. Um, so um, I have had, I have several publications up there. I have research reports, which is a really nice place to deposit those research reports. Because often I know when I've tried to find research reports, I can't find them, you know, particularly older ones. And um, it's really nice to have that as a space to um, have those reports somewhere where you can send agencies to and they can download them for free. Um, and, um, and then Karen has been incredibly helpful with me, just helping me figure out um, kind of what are the agreements that I'm you know, signing my life away to and, um, and what can and can't I um, post on the, um, on the website. So, um, so I have some pre-print publications there, um, which is really nice. Again, like for me, the federal grants that I've had often have this kind of double-barreled um, requirement where they require that I post them somewhere, but they won't pay for me to do it. And, um, and so I know NIH has different standards, which... I think are just a lot better than what I've had to deal with. And um, and so having Karen here to help me kind of navigate that has really been helpful. I guess I, well, thinking of where you started, Karen, the the two pathways, you know, in in my publishing, I've never considered a open access as a as an option. It's it's do I know the journal and what's its impact factor is the you know the leading things I think about um, and increasingly I really was excited to see this search option for open access journals to at least see that they're vetted although I'd like to see their impact factor shown yeah. there on the, <laughs> on the website too because that's another another uh, concern um, but you know the best part about this is you get to work with Karen. And so I sent her like 65 of my, of my bibliography and, um, you know, over the years at the poverty center, we have tried to host these on our site, but due to changes in the website, it's the same thing. I can't find stuff and 
uh, just knowing that it's somewhere where I can find it is really crucial or I can send somebody there. Um, and so of that 65, the way the process works is you submit, here's the, here's the list. And then I think of that 65, 15% could be posted in their final format. So nine of those 65 could actually go up in the scholarly commons in their final public publication version. The vast majority could only be posted in their author, the, what, the acronym I now hate, which is the author accepted manuscript, which is the last version that you sent to the, to the journal before it was published. Mm -hmm. So now imagine go, having to go back and find the last version of a journal article and from in the late in the late 90s where mine started so that's so i think i have 21 things in there where i was able to quickly find about a dozen of those last versions and now i have a list of 40 that i need to send to karen that i have to find in um, my life uh, <laughs> and then some that I, we're not sure whether they're yeah. um, can be posted even if we find them is that because the publisher won't allow you to publish or send it to scholar? Yeah, their publishers have different rules. A lot of them allow us to post, um, I would say the majority allow um, authors to post an accepted manuscript version of their article in a repository. Um, sometimes they ask for an embargo, so you know you have to wait 12 months, which is fine. We have the ability in the system to set a date for release. So you can submit it right away. But if it's been years, it's it's hard to find that version sometimes. Um, sometimes they only allow you to post the preprint, which is the submitted or submitted version, you know, the version before peer review. The accepted version includes peer review edits. It just didn't, it's, it's you know, before it gets all the formatting and uh, proofing that the, the makes it into the final publisher version. Um, yeah, is that it? sorry, I'm I'm forgetting now if that was answering your original question. <laughs> well, and I'll just add, I don't know, I had to arrive late. I'm sorry. Um, if you covered this, but for me, one of the advantages of publishing open access is the broader audience that can access this. So I have. One of my publications, we paid the OA fee for, and it's a collaboration among international scholars, and it's cited all the time because, right, one, because it's an international group, but also I think because yeah. people don't have to go behind a paywall to get it, and it's really wonderful to get that, to see that, you know, work being cited all over the world. Yeah, I was actually telling uh, before you were able to join us there, there was a, because uh, you've said this a lot of times, and I, I'm happy to show that we have some evidence. There was a paper that showed that like geographic mm -hmm. um, citation diversity of OA articles versus paywall mm -hmm. ones that yeah. they're actually finding evidence now that that diversity does, does exist in the citation. Yeah, to piggyback on that, how do people find the scholarly comments? Like, how do our colleagues out there around the globe know that this exists? So, um, we mostly get downloads from Scholar, uh, Google Scholar and Google, um, actually, search engines. So, most people who are accessing content are just using their everyday search engines. And we know that because um, there's actually a dashboard that um, we have for the whole repository that shows us where are we getting people referred to us, how are they finding us, and they're really finding us through Google and Google Scholar mostly, but other search engines as well. Um, and if you're an author who has work, you actually do have an author dashboard that kind of gives you all that information too, so you have some more data at your hands to sort of see what, um, how people are um, engaging with your work, where uh, people are engaging in your work. I don't know if you guys have actually gone in and looked at your dashboards. Yeah. <laughs> well, here's the I, you get it all. I, didn't, I know. didn't know it was called Scholarly Commons until Lowen <laughs> asked me to be on this panel and said and talk about your experience with the yeah. Scholarly Commons. I'm like, uh, no, Karen, but I don't think that is. <laughs> so <laughs> now I know. <laughs>
Bob, are you posting reports from your center? Because that's another area of gray literature where you could be posting things, I assume. I think that's the next rung. I wanted to test it out with, you know, the set of journal publications first, but we certainly have uh, to know about, you know, the the opportunity to put white papers and, and preprints. I wasn't sure if that was within scope or not, but that's something we will definitely do. And it is sort of a safeguard. So for example, if you don't have staff to post things on your on your center website or to keep it up to date, uh, or if the website somehow changes its design and things get lost, this would be a central backup, I think. Yeah, that's right. Kinds of sort of great literature. at some point we'll have to move to another platform we migrate all of that content and we have plans for how to do that and, and we think about that too so for preservation purposes like we're thinking about those things mm -hmm. um, and and have plans so that we can provide long-term access uh, you know both to the campus and wider audiences and those research reports are given a doi right so that's really nice right they get a permanent link. A permanent uh, link, yeah, not a DOI. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. But a permanent link, which is really nice, right? But, yeah. But we could probably talk about, you know, Oh, as well, yeah. I don't know the uh, difference. What's the difference? Yeah. <laughs> so a DOI is a digital object identifier that is um, uh, minted by um, specific organizations mm. like Crossref or DataCite. Um, and they're the only ones who can like actually oh. do this to make it a um, unique identifier. Um, and so we do have um, some ability with journals to give um, DOIs, uh, but we, I think that would be something we'd have to, mm -hmm. to look into is if we could do it for reports yeah. too. Um, and yeah, but you've probably seen DOIs, they become, you know, unique um, links. Um, and we don't typically give DOIs to like previously published work because they already have a DOI, we link to the DOI. So someone could go to the publisher version if they wanted to, but they also can access it right through our site as well. Uh, I ho hopefully that that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I um, Maybe you can clarify something. So I know if, if Richard emails me and says, I'd like a copy of your article, I can send him a PDF of the final version of my article and not get in trouble. Um, there's a website, I think it's Research Commons or something like that, that I, I've used for years where, where I have uploaded all the final versions of my um, articles, the pretty versions. And then people can make a request for a that copy and I can release it. And every time it says, do you want to make this public? And I say no, because it's just one person at a time requesting them. Yeah. Um, so this is really the only other way to stay on the right side of copyright laws. I know there are some senior scholars who just have put their final versions like on their website and, and said, here it is, like, come after me. <laughs> but I've never, I've never done that. Is that, you would advise against that? Um, I would advise against that unless your publisher allows you to do that. <laughs> uh, but, um, you know, I, I think ResearchGate might be one. ResearchGate, yeah. that's it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there's uh, definitely rules that you can't just necessarily post. It just depends on the publisher and each publisher is very different in the policies that they have around posting and sharing on different sites. I've actually seen some publishers who specifically say you are not allowed to post any version on ResearchGate. Oh, wow. um, it's not super common but it happens, but it would be also, um, it, it, you know, it could be different because you're not posting them publicly too. Okay. Um, so it depends if you're posting something publicly versus controlling access because you are allowed often within your um, agreement to give a certain number of copies to colleagues and things like that. So there are some like, but it depends on each publisher and each publisher agreement. So it's hard to give a, wholesale answer, um, but I would just be, um, if you have an open access article, 
that's one nice thing is you know you can share it and post it in multiple places. That's the point. But with um, you know a traditional publisher, you might not be able to. And uh, a lot of times you don't even realize that when you're signing that um, agreement, what you're really agreeing to. Um, and and sometimes that's kind of maybe deliberate. Sometimes it's on the publisher's part. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> And I would, I would note for this audience, so I was surprised to see when Karen sent me back my list, what journals wouldn't allow a final version. So in our, in our domain, like families and society, children and youth services review, journal of public child welfare, research on social work practice, they all only, those journals only allow an author, author's final version. But right. children and youth services review is also now, now though, now, that's new. Now. So, yeah. so, so as of this year, for our, can, net, our new publication, for our new publications, if you yeah. publish with <laughs> them, um, that's part of the open access agreements. So you can, but it doesn't go backwards. It doesn't go backwards. No, sorry. <laughs> but it means good information for the yeah. future. Yeah. Um, yeah, it is. And, and, you know, sometimes I've also reached out to publishers on behalf of authors to ask, hey, can we post this? Mm -hmm. um, I get very mixed uh, responses. Sometimes they don't respond to me at all. Sometimes they say, oh, yeah, you can do that for a fee, which happened actually um, with, with you that yeah. they were like, oh, yeah, you can do that, but you have to pay this much. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. then um, sometimes they're like, oh, yeah, go ahead. That's fine. So it, it really is like, a, it's worth asking and I always do, but, um, you know, sometimes even with the publishers, we can maybe try to go back and ask them. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'll say I had to get over the fact that I like the pretty version. I like the final mm -hmm. formatted. Yeah. <laughs> I want people to see that version, not my last version. Yeah. But at the end of the day, it's about the content. Mm -hmm. It's about what's written there and seeing the tables and whatever. And that, they can always go on and then f get the final version yeah. if they really want it. Yeah, yeah. So that accepted version is the content is pretty much the same. Yeah. It's just the uh, you know it's not been formatted um, like the final version. Um, and then I've had you know people, and this is something to think about too. It's like you know they can put their preprint up there, but they're like actually like after peer review a lot changed and I don't want to post that version because it's such a different article now and that's things that we can talk about too and um you know if if we can't put a peer review version um you know there might be times where we can't post it so it is good to know that there's definitely some limitations and if you are uh publishing also and you want to make sure you can post in the repository um, I can also talk to you about tools you can use to talk to your publisher about making sure you have that ability to, to post it. Now we now that we know there's a competition for the most downloads, uh, well, we have to, to we got to get in the game. We need more. <laughs> <laughs> we got to get in there. Do you have questions online? Uh, we do not. I have a question. I'm pretty new to all the all this. Um, when the if you post stuff in scholarly comments, I have, we have a I have a lot of work, a lot of reports, things that will never be published, and that's most of my work isn't like that publishable type work, but it is a lot of analytics and a lot of reports, and um, and so this is really fascinating to me, and really I'm definitely going to use this. Um, are there keywords like when you submit something to Scholarly Commons? Are there keywords that you can choose to help optimize your the search criteria yes, or whatever? Yes, I, I recommend doing that. Uh, yeah, for discoverability purposes. So there is a keyword um, uh, uh, field that you can actually enter your own keywords into. Mm -hmm. um, uh, recommended words that you you want, and then there's a controlled subject uh, discipline list. Um, where you can also attach um, specific disciplines uh, to the article um, to help also. So yes, um, I did mention that it's not a required field, but I I would highly recommend. Yeah, I think. 
that's part of the initial, that's part of the one time A, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, that's part of the initial form um, for any article is that you can fill out all that information. You can fill out as much or as little as you want. Yeah. If reports are being posted, I assume they'd be subject to whatever agreement was made with the sponsor if it's a funded report of a funded project or study, right? So those ones are simple because there's not a easy way to find that out too. But it, um, but that's something that you know. Usually, uh, I'll also work with authors to say, you know, was this funded? You know how um, sometimes there's information on the websites that I can find. Um, I think there was one with yours actually that I found. We could post it. Uh, they specifically put on their website, you know, any authors of work can post it. Um, or, you know, they might have, um, you know, just user um, uh, things on their website. But yes, yeah, we do have to be mindful of, of reports who funded them if, if they have any uh, rights over that report. <laughs> For a, for a new scholar who's just beginning to write and publish, do you have like a, a few tips on where they should begin on this? Should they start looking at these open access journals that we have agreements with? Where would, would they want to start? Um, I think that it's going to depend a little bit on, I hate to tell people where to publish because I know sometimes there's discipline specific things that you kind of have to do. Um, but I would look at what are your open access options, whether it is journals we have agreements with or whether it's a diamond open access journal or, or what have you. What are your open access options? And if for some reason those open access options don't align with some things you maybe need to do for um, other reasons like promotion um, or, uh, you know, I, I would look at like, <laughs> can you do something like post it in a repository and talk to the library and the librarians about how you can work with your publisher to make sure it can be posted in the repository, um, you know, whatever version that is. So I think just being aware of your different options um, early on and um, kind of deciding what your goals are too. I think that's one thing is, is a lot of people will tell me, well, I have to publish in these specific journals um, because they're important for my field. And you have to kind of decide, okay, is that your goal then that you're going to do that? And uh, yeah. and even if you can't go an open access publishing route. I don't know if that, sorry, that was like maybe a roundabout way of talking about it. Um, <laughs> um, but kind of thinking it from a bigger picture too of, of what are your goals, why, you know, um, and then maybe if you can't publish one paper, um, can you publish another paper as an open access um, article too? So I think being aware of what's available to you and thinking about what those higher goals are too and also being aware of the fact that you can ask your publisher and negotiate with your publisher around what you can post openly and what you can't. You mentioned hybrid journals before. Yeah. So I'm thinking of a journal where I get the you know recent uh, announcement mm -hmm. of a copy and, and like one article in the list will say open access. Mm -hmm. And I always wonder whether did the journal decide to make that open access or did the authors pay to make their, could that, could it either be true? It could potentially be either. It's probably typically the authors paid to make it open access uh, either. Someone. Um, there have been times like COVID-19 where all COVID-19 research was made openly available. Um, but that was because it was, um, you know, part of like national mm -hmm. emergency. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of folks didn't have to pay open access fees during that time, but their work was made openly accessible. But typically, um, yeah, they're paying in some way.
Thank you to our contestants. You played a wonderful uh, game. <laughs> Thanks everybody for, uh, for joining us and for doing this. Uh, let's wrap this up. <laughs> Enjoy the beautiful weather. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Thank you. Make sandwiches.